Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Justin Meyer. I'm the Director of Development for the Department of Neurosurgery. Thank you for joining us today, and we hope that we find you all safe and well. This is your first time joining us for Fridays with Freelander. We've covered many remarkable topics by incredible expert UPMC and University of Pittsburgh neurosurgeons, clinicians, and researchers. If you've missed any of our past presentations and would like to view them, please visit the dedicated Fridays with Freelander page on our department website at www.neurosurgery.pit.edu. I'll also be posting my email address in the chat box. Feel free to send me any questions or comments you may have as well. All of our attendees' mics are muted, but you can type a question in the Q&A chat box. And we'll try to get to as many as we can in our allotted time. This week, we're delighted to highlight one of our extraordinary expert clinicians, Dr. Jeffrey Balzer. But first, I would like to welcome our Chair of Neurosurgery, Dr. Robert Freelander, to give an update on the happenings from the last week. Dr. Freelander, thank you, and please take it away. Uh, thank you, Justin. Again, pleasure to be with all of you uh, today. Again, as I usually do, what I'd like to uh, provide is a little update on the COVID uh, situation, particularly as it pertains to our hospitals, and then uh, be delighted to, to introduce uh, Dr. Bolzer. Uh, the COVID situation, as you all know, the numbers have uh, significantly increased over the past uh, several weeks. I was happy uh, to see in the daily reports that I received over the, at least the past uh, two, three days, uh, it seems like uh, the numbers have stabilized, maybe going down a little bit. Uh, again, uh, it's uh, not gonna uh, claim any kind of victory at this point because we uh, must still remain uh, very vigilant, but uh, hopefully that that uh, spike uh, that we've seen, uh, maybe it's coming to a halt at, at this uh, point, but it is uh, too early to tell. We must remain vigilant and do all the things that we know to do, social distancing, wearing masks, uh, um, washing our hands and all these kinds of uh, uh, things. Again, I want to stress, and the reason I bring this up is the fact that I want to make sure that anybody that needs care makes uh, to make sure that they do come to either come to the hospital or contact their physicians. Uh, we're doing quite a bit of uh, care via telemedicine, so our patients don't even have to come to the hospital to get that initial consultation. So again, I want to uh, stress the importance of not uh, delaying uh, care or hospitals running at full steam, uh, we've opened uh, extra ICU beds, extra beds uh, to make sure we have capacity to take care of our patients, both the COVID uh, patients as well as the patients that uh, regularly uh, come here. Again, our hospital remains uh, uh, with uh, taking extreme measures to make sure that, the ho that we're as safe as possible. There's a questionnaire for every visitor that uh, comes in. Every single person coming into the hospital has their temperature checked, everybody's wearing uh, masks, uh, uh, enhance uh, uh, hygienic uh, precautions uh, throughout uh, the hospital. And I myself uh, feel very safe as well as any patient of mine that needs to come to the hospital. Uh, I, I, I am uh, certain that they're in a fairly uh, safe environment uh, here. So again, uh, I urge anybody that needs uh, care to make sure to contact us uh, in, in that uh, hole that uh, obviously uh, big changes have occurred uh, this week with the uh, approvals of uh, two uh, vaccines. Uh, some of uh, the members of uh, the hospital and the department are starting to get the, the vaccines, but it's going to be a lengthy process. It's going to take uh, several months certainly for uh, the whole population to be uh, vaccinated, anybody who wants to be uh, vaccinated, but it's uh, it's very exciting at least that we're, we're turning a, a very important uh, a point uh, uh, at, at, at this uh, period. Now, over the past uh, several months, uh, we've uh, interviewed and had have had presentations of many of what I consider the best neurosurgeons in the whole world. Uh, the work that uh, that my colleagues uh, do is uh, truly remarkable. And many patients come here from not only all of Western Pennsylvania, from all over the country and all over the world for the very expert care that our uh, physicians uh, uh, provide. Our neurosurgeons get very, very good, both because they're talented, but also it's practice. Uh, our, our neurosurgeons do over and over again some of the most complex uh, cases in the world, I must uh, say. Now, one of the reasons that we're able to do what we do, as well as to do them as safely as possible, is by the work that Dr. Balzer will be describing. Dr. Balzer has been uh, with us in the department for almost 30 years. He's got a massive amount of uh, experience. And what he does is he, and he'll describe, he monitors the patients during surgery to make sure that nothing bad is happening. And it's amazing the work that he does. 
Uh, I've been in other hospitals uh, uh, before, some of the leading hospitals in the country, and the work that Dr. Bolzer and his team uh, uh, provides and the help that they provided us really is outstanding. So uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor to introduce to you Dr. Jeff uh, Bolzer. Dr. Bolzer, please uh, take it away. Thanks, Dr. Friedlander. I appreciate uh, the, the gracious introduction and for giving me an opportunity to uh, describe my what is now a 30 year journey at, at UPMC. Um, what I wanted to do was give you an overview of what intraoperative monitoring is, um, give you an overview of, of the application of the monitoring, how the team works together with neurosurgery, and then give you a feel for the different types of testing we can do in the operating room. And the last thing I want to do is I want to highlight the work that we've done here at UPMC um, with regards to really evidence-based medicine, looking at these studies that we do and really ratifying the the, 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 the ability for us to prevent um, bad events from occurring, to allow for surgical procedures to um, come to more complete ends with regards to the monitoring, and really give you a feel for the, the fact that we're a multidisciplinary service, and we apply these intraoperative monitoring services um, in many, many different surgical procedures. And quite frankly, we've basically written the book on intraoperative monitoring um, in all of these procedures for everyone in the country. So, so, so what, what is intraoperative monitoring and why do we do it? Well, it, 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 it may not be obvious to everyone, but neurosurgical procedures are generally performed under general anesthesia. So the patient is, is completely anesthetized. And the irony about that is we're operating on the central and peripheral nervous systems, but what we can't do, but what we'd like to be able to do during surgery is ask the patient, if they're okay, wiggle your toes. Can you see? Can you smell? Can you hear? Um, the, the problem is, is because the patient is generally anesthetized, there's no way to reliably know what the neurological status of the patient is during the procedure. So you essentially have to wait until the procedure is over and wake the patient up to know that. And, and why is that potentially an issue? Well, if something were to occur during the procedure that is reversible, for example, we can intervene at that time rather than waiting till the end of the procedure. So what intraoperative neurophysiological monitoring does is it acts as a real-time surrogate for the neuro exam. We are, in fact, the continuous neurological examination during all these procedures. So in general, and I'm going to give you a 10,000-foot view of this because I don't want to get mired in the details, uh, the, 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 the painful details of this, but how does it work? So what we do in the operating room is we generate and measure electrical impulses from the central nervous system and from the patient. And we record these continuously during the procedures. And we look for changes in these potentials and what the potential impact of that change is on the nervous system during the procedure. So what we do is we attach electrodes to the patient's wrists, ankles, scalp, different muscle groups, depending on the type of surgery that's being done and depending on the type of recordings that we want to do. And what we record in a specific surgical procedure is determined by what that procedure is, where that surgery is occurring, and, and what, what are the structures at risk during that particular uh, procedure. So the electrodes record the responses from your nervous system to electrical stimulation, and what these can do is indicate changes in the function of the nervous system. If and when we do see changes, what the neurophysiology team does is immediately alert the surgeon, and if necessary and if possible, an appropriate intervention is initiated. So when I first started doing this 30 years ago, one of the things that I thought was, well, wait a second, these patients are asleep, they're generally anesthetized. How are you indexing their central nervous system? The, the amazing thing about intraoperative monitoring is we can test your feeling, we can test your motor responses, we can test your hearing, we can test your vision, all while you're generally anesthetized. So all of these general senses that we have and our ability to move can be tested in a generally anesthetized patient. So what's the advantage of doing intraoperative monitoring? Well, what it, what it allows for is it allows a surgical team to efficiently and in real time detect problems. And once these problems are detected, that allows for a reduction or prevention of permanent long-term impairment during a surgical procedure. 
The other thing that allows for it, and this is oftentimes overlooked with intraoperative monitoring, it also allows the surgical procedure to be more aggressive, if you will, if needed with the help of IONM. So for example, the surgeon will do a surgical maneuver what, with removing a tumor or correcting a deformity in the spinal cord, and they'll look at us and say, are the potentials okay? Are your responses still on baseline? And if we say yes, then we potentially can take more tumor or be a little bit more aggressive or do a little bit more correction in the spine. So as a consequence of the intraoperative monitoring, it's really guiding what we're doing, not just when there are changes, but also when there are no changes in the monitoring as well. So what the monitoring does is it provides an early warning system to detect impending neural injury. And, and the word impending is really important here because what it allows for is it allows for the reversibility of a number of these changes. And, and that's really important because what we want to be able to do is say, we're seeing changes. Okay, we're going to change how we're taking tumor or how we're addressing the spinal cord, or we're going to raise the patient's blood pressure, or we're going to change the patient's positioning, all in an attempt to reverse the change we're seeing in these potentials and the patient wake up with no new deficits. So what about the team here at UPMC? So one of the things that Dr. Freelander alluded to in my introduction was that you know, we, we really and truly work as a team here at UPMC, and our team is composed of the surgeon, the clinical neurophysiologist, the anesthesiologist, the neuromonitoring technologist, and the nursing staff. And, and, and the really important aspect of that is everybody's on the same page every day. Everybody's communicating. Everybody knows what each other are doing. Everyone understands their job, but also understands, even at a very elementary fashion, the job that everyone in the room is doing. I always joke with Dr. Freelander and tell him that I, I, I know what's going on during neurosurgical procedures as much as a neurosurgeon knows what's going on. And, and I have to know that because if I see changes in the evoked potential monitoring, I have to understand the anatomy and the physiology and the surgical procedure itself so that I can make recommendations to the surgical team about what they might do to mitigate those changes. So as a clinical neurophysiologist, I have training and experience, obviously, in a general field of clinical neurophysiology, and that's an in-depth knowledge of evoked potentials, as well as a knowledge in anesthesiology and neurosurgery. So I've always advocated in my 30 years that as a neurophysiologist, we need to understand the anesthesia and the neurosurgery and, and every aspect of what's going on nearly as well as everyone else in the room is. And, and quite frankly, that's why we're able to provide the service that we provide at such a high level because the training program that we have here that I put my colleagues through and I've developed over the 30 years and the technologists here go through is, is really second to none. So what, what my job is, is to interpret these electrophysiological changes during the surgery. And then what I do is I offer a differential diagnosis as to what might be going on. If I look at Dr. Freelander and say, the potentials have changed, that really does him or me no good. My explanation is these potentials have changed and here's why I think they've changed. It's, it's, it's number one, I think it's this, number two, I think it's this, and number three, I think it's this. And then we talk and we communicate back and forth. And as a consequence of that communication and differential diagnosis, we come up with right in the operating room, potential therapeutic interventions to, 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 to make the change better and to obviously try to prevent any new neurological deficits from occurring in the patient. So as you can imagine, as, I, as I've hinted to, uh, communication in these procedures is really of the utmost importance. Um, the surgical team really does use a real-time feedback from the neurophysiologist to evaluate how the, how the nervous system is responding during the surgery. It's, it's often during these procedures that the surgeon will look at whomever's in the room and say, how are the potentials? How, are, how is the neuromonitoring? And because, because that's all being incorporated and being used as, as a means by which to move on with the procedure and make it safer. So what do we monitor during these cases? What are the types of modal modalities we use? So we employ a, a wide variety of different modalities and each of the different things we record and measure in the operating room has a specific application. And, and it's oftentimes the case that we're not just doing one of these, we're doing a multiplicity of these recordings at the same time. So that's called multimodality monitoring. So what we monitor are something called somatosensory evoked potentials. And as its name suggests, it's an assay of your ascending sensory um, central nervous system. We do motor evoked potentials. 
which is a measure of your ability to move or to walk. Um, so one is a sensory measure. The second is a motor measure. We also do brainstem auditory evoke potentials. We are able to, in real time, measure your ability to hear during these procedures. So if it's a procedure in and around your the nerve in your brainstem that controls your hearing, we can give feedback to the surgeon that that might be changing. We, sh we can also do visual evoke potentials during these procedures where we can actually measure whether or not you have the ability to see or not uh, during these procedures. And I'll give you an example of that in a paper that we just published out of this institution. We also do EEG, which is a measure, uh, a measure of unstimulated activity, but a, the gold standard for measuring ischemia. Is there enough blood flow going to the brain? Is there enough oxygen going there? And one of the last things we measure is something called electromyography, which are EMG recordings. So these are recordings from your muscles, but every one of your muscles, whether it be in your face or your tongue or your limbs or your legs, is innervated by nerves, cranial nerves or peripheral nerves. So if the surgery involves manipulation or tumor or tumor removal around the cranial nerves, we're able to record from the musculature that is innervated by those nerves that might be at risk. The same is true during spine surgery. We can measure the muscles from your arms and legs and look for activity concerning specific nerve roots. More importantly, we can also stimulate those nerve roots and record those potentials to identify nerves that may not be obvious in the field, secondary to tumor or secondary to scar. So it's a, it's a really, um, really valuable modality. So this is, this is essentially the, the, the intraoperative neuromonitoring algorithm we use. So we have all these modalities, SSEPs, MEPs, brainstem, auditory evoke potentials, EEG and e e EMG. The first and most important thing that we have to make sure of is that each of these measures are diagnostically accurate. And what does that mean? I, I have to know that when I see a change, that that change is accurately reflecting a change in the nervous system. Because you can imagine if, if, if that weren't the case, I would be telling the surgeons all the time, well, there's a change, there's a change, and there's a change. And if it's not real, then the confidence level in the surgical team about what I'm telling them decreases. So diagnostic accuracy is of the utmost importance. Once we know that the modalities we're using are diagnostically accurate, we rely on recognition, i.e. we see the change, we're able to identify it, and we're able to tell the surgeon. The next is in the interpretation of the change. What's causing the change at that point? Once we know it's accurate, we've recognized it, we have a supposition as to what's causing the change, we then look for ways to reverse the change that we're seeing, and that involves consideration. And, and that last box is really important, and quite frankly, why intraoperative monitoring is so valuable here at UPMC, and quite frankly, why it does make the surgery safer, because the surgeons trust the monitoring. And when I walk in a room and I say there's a problem, the consideration occurs immediately. There's never, oh yeah, that's something, it's, it's not really what you think it is, or oh, I really wasn't doing anything. We, we take great pride in the fact that we are, our data is diagnostically accurate, and if I'm talking to a surgeon about a change, everybody in the room listens. So just very briefly, let me describe each of these modalities we do, and then we'll get into some of the data we've collected here for a variety of procedures so that you can get a feel for when and how we do these things. So the somatosensory evoke potential, as I said, is a sensory potential. And the way that we generate these is we stimulate your peripheral nerves. And we do, this, do these with uh, little electrodes that we place over your peripheral nerves. And then what we do is we record the potential that A sends or, or goes from your, from your arms and legs to your brain through the, through, through the brachial plexus, through your spine, through your brainstem, and into your somatosensory cortex. So we make recordings along the entirety of the neural axis. So if we see a change, not only can I say there's a change, I can say that the, the change is occurring in the brain, or I can say that the change is occurring in the thalamus, or I can say that the change is occurring in the brainstem, or I can say that it's a peripheral response. So it's really important to be able to, to uh, identify where the change is occurring, and we can do that very, very easily in the operating room. So as I said, the somatosensory evoke potential or SSP reflects information that's flowing from the periphery towards the brain in the posterior part of the spinal cord. We use SSEPs commonly during almost every surgery we do where IOM is, is, is uh, utilized. 
And we also use it as a complement to other modalities such as motor evoked potentials, EMG and EEG. Motor evoked potentials in contrast to sensory potentials are a descending potentials. So, so to generate these, we actually stimulate on your scalp to, to activate the motor cortex because your, your, your muscles and your legs and walking and movement is controlled by activity coming from your brain to your arms and legs versus sensory activity, which is from your arms and legs to your brain. And what we do in these cases is we stimulate the, uh, the, the cortex by stimulating the scalp, and then we record EMG potentials from your muscles in your arms and legs. And these are really, really important when we're doing uh, spine procedures and spine procedures of great complexity. And they're also becoming very, very important in tumor resection and also in aneurysm surgery. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. But so, so in contrast to SSEPs, which are generated on the posterior side of the spinal cord, motor evoked potential activity is carried on the anterior or lateral side of the spinal cord. So you can see why these are often done at the same time, because we want to know what's going on in the entirety of the spinal cord, cord not just one section. Brainstem auditory evoked potentials, as I said to you, are a reflection of your ability to hear. And this potential is generated by the cochlear nerve or the nerve that, that allows for you to hear, but also is an assay of the auditory pathway through the brainstem. And again, I was always amazed when I first started doing this, we put, as you can see from the bottom left-hand picture, we put little earphones in the patient's ears and we deliver clicks. Now remember, the patient is generally anesthetized completely asleep, but despite that, we're able to generate these potentials in the central nervous system and have a real-time assay of whether or not anything is changing during these procedures. Visual evoked potentials. Ironically, we can also do these in patients who are generally anesthetized and in fact, who, whose eyes are closed. So this is a response to visual stimulation. In the operating room, we deliver a flash stimulation. And the way that that's delivered is, you can see that top uh, uh, panel there, that photograph, those are like swimming goggles, if you will. And embedded in those swimming goggles are diodes that provide flashes of light to the eyes. And those flashes of light in the anesthetized patient can generate a potential along the entirety of the visual pathway. And so we're able to measure that potential and we're able to discern whether or not there's anything changing along the course of the visual pathway during these procedures. EEG, as I mentioned earlier, is a measure of unstimulated cortical activity. We measure EEG by looking for changes in the frequency of the activity. As frequency gets lower, goes from higher to lower, that means that the patient is more deeply anesthetized. It also is an indication of ischemia in these cases. So as EEG becomes flatter or as EEG becomes less active, it can be an indication of ischemia. And ischemia can, be, can occur from a variety of different things during uh, tumor surgery, during aneurysm surgery, or during carotid endarterectomy, and we'll talk about that as well. The last thing uh, that we that we measure is called electromyography or EMG. And as I said, this is recorded by placing pairs of electrodes in muscles that are innervated by either the cranial nerves or the spinal nerve roots. And, and what this allows for is it allows for real-time identification of whether or not the nerve root is being manipulated or stretched or retracted. And it's really, really important because sometimes we do need to manipulate these cranial nerves or peripheral nerves to get the job done or to get the tumor out, or to put the instrumentation in the spine. But what we want to provide is a level of feedback to the surgeon. And the, the, one of the interesting things we do in these cases is all this activity is actually put through a speaker in the room so that the surgeon can actually hear the firing of these cranial nerves and the muscles firing so that despite the fact that they're operating, their hands and their technique is responding to what they're hearing. And it really doesn't get more real time than that. So it really allows for changes in technique to occur in real time based on what the surgeon's hearing, based on the feedback from the EMG we're recording. So when do we apply these tests at UPMC? So intraoperative neuromonitoring, we perform in both the adult and pediatric patient population. So everything we're talking about, everything I'm gonna talk, talk about today in terms of the, the data we've published, we do in both the adult and over at the children's hospital in the pediatric patient population. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about spine surgery, a little bit about cranial surgery, a little bit about endovascular surgery, 
some about vascular surgery. And if we have time at the end, I'll mention uh, the, the value out of intraoperative monitoring in the ICU. Um, but we also do intraoperative monitoring for other disciplines as well, cardiac surgery, ENT, and orthopedic. And I'll, if, like, if we have time, I'll talk about some of our cardiac literature that we've recently published, because I think cardiac surgery is almost neurosurgery, because when we see problems in cardiac surgeries, we typically involve a neurosurgeon on the back end to try to aid in what may have gone wrong during cardiac procedure. So let's start with spine surgery. And I'm gonna review the literature that we've published here, and I'm gonna show my age, my age a little bit. So, so um, we, have, we have really written the book on intraoperative monitoring in spine surgery here, and, and I'm talking about every aspect of spine surgery. I'm talking about instrumentation, I'm talking about scoliosis. So the two papers on the right were papers that we published um, at one in 2014 and one more recently, where we looked at the application of somatocentury evoked potentials in scoliosis procedures and the application of doing somatocentury evoked potentials and motor evoked potentials in idiopathic scoliosis. One of the reasons that we are so um, respected here with regards to the IOM is because we do so many procedures and we have access to all this data. The, the, the top paper that I'm referring to with regards to scoliosis is, is over uh, a review of over 500 patients that we monitor at Children's Hospital here at UPMC. So, so we, have, we have the largest um, series of IOM in, in a number of these different patients and anywhere in the country. The, uh, the other two papers uh, are a reference to stimulating pedicle screws. The, the paper on the bottom, persistently electrified pedicle screw stimulation. We, we developed this technique here at UPMC in the late 90s where we're able to identify when a, an instrumentation, specifically a screw, may be misplaced during the procedure so that we can actually redirect the screw and as a consequence, not have the patient wake up with a new neurological deficit. We also have done and published a lot of literature on the cervical spine. Uh, the top left-hand uh, paper is a paper that, uh, a technique that we, we, we developed here um, and is now used across the country to look at uh, placement of uh, spinal cord stimulators in, in the cervical spine. And I developed a technique called, called collision testing here. And we did this in a, in a large series of patients. And like I said, it's now been adopted across the country. We've looked at um, the cervical spine, both in anterior cervical discectomy patients and you can see that this paper that we published uh, back in 2007 was over a thousand cases. So the robustness of this data is, is incredible. And, and what we're able to show is that the diagnostic accuracy and the ability to intervene when we see changes is exquisite when you're doing IOM in these cases. We then went on to uh, publish our experience with corpectomy, which is a little bit different uh, cervical spine procedure, a little bit more complicated, a little bit more ex extensive. And again, we looked at 508 procedures and extolled the virtues of IOM during those procedures as well. We've also looked at um, both, both in-house uh, looked at the, the, the ability of multimodality neuromonitoring to aid in uh, lumbar procedures and instrumentation procedures um, using SSEPs and EMG. But the bottom paper was, was a multidisciplinary approach. We did a multi-center trial that Dr. Kanner and I were involved with where we looked at the ability of EMG in a lateral fusion technique to, uh, to predict and prevent symptomatic um, neuropraxy in these patients. So not only do we do we uh, analyze and publish and present our own results, but we're also part of a large multidisciplinary team that does multi-center trials. This trial was done across the United States, but also in Germany, and we published that data back in 2015. The other thing we've done is we've gone back and we've looked at, at other things that can affect somatocentric evoked potentials during spine surgery. So the position of the patient on the on the table. So it's really important for the surgical team to have a, an appreciation for how the patient's positioned. And you can see from the bottom paper, we just recently published a paper where like we did with cervical spine, we also did the same thing with the thoracic spine in procedures. So we went back and looked at our very large series, published this in, a, in Journal Neurosurgery Spine, and looked at the efficacy of somatosensory evoked potentials in evaluating new deficits in thoracic spine surgery. So we've basically covered the spine from top to bottom in a number of different procedures through, through the data we've analyzed. A little bit about craniotomy. 
One of the procedures we do here quite a bit is something called microvascular decompression. Uh, this was one of the first surgeries I ever monitored back in 1992 with Dr. Janetta, who pioneered this surgery. And this is where we, um, we, we, we do a, what's called a, a suboccipital craniectomy, a micro, and we look at the cranial nerves and patients uh, can have facial pain uh, secondary to something called trigeminal neuralgia or have a spasm in their face called hemifacial spasm. And the way that this is relieved is by moving these vessels off the cranial nerves in the um, cerebellar pontine angle. But in moving these cranial nerves and doing these surgeries, what it does is it puts, puts the cranial nerves at risk. Specifically, it puts the cochlear nerve or the auditory nerve or the nerve that's responsible for hearing at risk. So we want to monitor those. And we do that using these brainstem auditory evoked potentials. I showed you a picture of that before. Again, we really have written the book on, on how to do this safely, what to look for, when to warn the surgeon. This is a chapter we just recently published looking at um, monitoring during microvascular decompression. We've looked at our hearing outcomes data. I think, I think anytime you publish data about intraoperative monitoring, you have to look at the outcomes and you have to look at how the monitoring is affecting the outcomes. We've also looked at the diagnostic accuracy of these brainstem auditory evoked potentials during these procedures. We have one of the largest series ever published looking at hemifacial spasm, 293 patients. And what we did is we did voluminous analysis about, about you know, what types of patients uh, are, are best served, which ones aren't. And this is really important information for the surgical team, even preoperatively, to be able to give the patient about, listen, here's what we've found from our monitoring. Here's what we've found from these procedures. We know that given your particular case, we have a 95% chance of making you 100% better after this procedure, et cetera, et cetera. We've then also gone on to look at different aspects of the brainstem auditory evoked potential and, and analyze in a very large series, which are best to look at during these procedures, which, are most, which is the most sensitive indicator of hearing loss in these cases. Again, uh, when to establish baselines um, during these procedures, um, we published a paper in Acta Neurosurgica looking at the empirical factors associated with decompression, which is, again, really important. We've also looked at the effect of other types of uh, therape therapeutic applica uh, applications in these procedures. So a lot of patients with hemifacial spasm get Botox injections. And what we were finding was is that the, the monitoring was a little bit different in these patients than it was in patients who didn't get Botox. And what we did is we looked at our very large series and what we were able to do was make a recommendation to the field that if you're having a microvascular decompression, you should discontinue the use of Botox for six months before you have it done. And if you don't, it renders the utility of the intraoperative neuromonitoring less than, if, if, than, than it does if you haven't had Botox. We also do a lot of skull-based procedures to an expanded endonasal approach where we take out tumors from the, uh, from the skull base through the nose. And this is just a picture of the, the approaches that we use and a, and a cavernous sinus tumor. Once again, we've looked at the utility of somatocentry evoked potentials in the adult and the pediatric patient population. We've looked at the value of multimodality monitoring during these procedures and show that if you do SSEPs and uh, brainstem auditory evoked potentials, uh, it increases the probability of the patients waking up with a better outcome. And as I said, we've also published our series um, using uh, in skull-based uh, procedures during endoscopic endonasal procedures in the pediatric patient population. We've also looked at the utility of EMG in these cases. So value of free-run EMG from the extraocular cranial nerves, value of free-run free EMG from lower cranial nerves. So, so our approach to these procedures is if we're going to do it, we have to extol the virtues of why we're there and what help we're providing. And that's what these studies have done at UPMC. We just published this paper actually last week. Um, there, there, we do run into problems occasionally in these procedures because we have tumors wrapped around, around vessels. And so, so we, we published our series looking at the role of intraoperative neuromonitoring when you do have an internal carotid artery injury during these procedures and how that monitoring guides us as to what to do once you have this injury. Do you have to repair the vessel? Do you have to go to endovascular procedures? Or can you just leave it alone and the patient will do fine? The monitoring gives us all that insight during the procedures. Again, more cranial nerve monitoring during these procedures. Cerebral aneurysm surgery, different ways to do aneurysm surgery. We both do open clipping of aneurysms and we do endovascular um, um, 
uh, treatment of these aneurysms. In, in both cases, there is risk to the central nervous system, particularly to the vasculature uh, during these procedures. So intraoperative monitoring plays a critical role. When we do clipping, you can see from the, uh, the, anime, the uh, cartoon on the right, we're putting clips across saccular aneurysms and excluding them from the vessels. And there's, there's risk in that, right? Because you want to make sure your clip's not across a parent vessel. Again, We've, we've published and we've looked at our series with Dr. Friedlander and others here who clip these aneurysms. So we looked at the, the appropriate amount of time that you can temporarily clip these vessels, giving some insight as to when it, what's the safe zone for doing these types of procedures. We've also looked at the risk factors uh, for stroke in these patients. So we wanna know ahead of time what we're dealing with in these procedures before we go ahead and do them. And the intraoperative monitoring has given us a lot of insight. This was a paper we just published with Dr. Friedlander, where we looked at the use of visual evoke potentials during ophthalmic aneurysm surgery. So these were cases where we knew ahead of time that we were going to have to sacrifice the ophthalmic artery, which provides blood supply to your eye in order to treat the aneurysm. So we wanted to gain some insight in the operating room as to whether or not we could do that safely. So we did visual evoke potentials in these cases, along with waking the patient up in the middle of the surgery. And you know that sounds sounds like wow that's amazing in terms of can you do that and the answer is we can do that so not only have we found that we can do it safely but we also know that the intraoperative neuromonitoring can be used as a guide for that in endovascular surgery this is where the surgery is not done through a, through a craniotomy but rather it's done through the vessel itself where we put coils in the aneurysm to make it go away and thrombose um, just very briefly we published the largest series in the country looking at the diagnostic accuracy of SSEPs during endovascular aneurysm treatment. This was almost 900 patients that we did. And what we found that the, like, like, like everything else we've done so far, is that the SSEP monitoring is really a valuable tool for identifying problems and thereby preventing complications by allowing therapeutic intervention to occur. Carotids very quickly. Um, when you have a, a blockage in your carotid artery in the neck, we do a procedure called a carotid endarterectomy where we remove the plaque. Again, we've looked at this up and down, not only in terms of the value of the monitoring, but also in terms of the long-term implications of the monitoring in these cases. So we've looked at not only cranial nerve injury, we've looked at what patients are at risk um, during these procedures for, for needing, a, needing a shunt or there being a change in the intraoperative neuromonitoring. But we've also looked at the, 30, uh, the diagnostic value of SSEPs during the 30-day perioperative period. And ironically, what we found is, and this is incredibly valuable data, if you do a carotid endarterectomy and you see a change in the monitoring and the patient still wakes up fine, we know that within that 30-day period, there is still a higher risk for that patient succumbing to a stroke because we saw changes in the neuromonitoring. So the neuromonitoring can act as a biomarker for later stage strokes in these patients, which is incredibly important for the, for the practitioner to know. Very quickly, we do it a lot in anesthetized brain surgery. We have a number of different techniques that we can use in the operating room. One is called phase reversal. This is, allows us to identify what's motor cortex and what's sensory cortex. So we, 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 this allows us to approach the tumor with the lowest risk for the patient. We can do direct cortical stimulation where we put a grid down directly on the brain. We can stimulate the motor cortex and recur, record motor evoke potentials while the tumor is being resected. The other thing we can do is we can stimulate deep in the tumor resection bed to know how close we are to critical structures during the resection. So what this does is it prevents injury from occurring because we can give the surgeon immediate feedback. It's like, okay, stop. You're within a couple millimeters of, of, of the motor tract, so we want to stop at that point. We also do these types of things in awake surgeries. We know that awake craniotomy is really valuable for decreasing iatrogenic injury. These are just some photographs of us in the operating room. So this is the patient being set up. This is the far right photograph is us talking to the patient during the procedure. And what we're able to do is we're able to map out language areas in these patients so that we're able to better avoid areas that are called eloquent cortex, motor areas or language areas. And as a consequence, perform these surgeries, take these tumor, tumors out in a much more safe fashion. We've also published papers in the ICU looking at uh, evoke potentials, uh, improving prognostication after cardiac arrest, and also in cardiac procedures as well, 
where we're also now written a book on using intraoperative monitoring during these cardiac procedures. The paper on the far right was a paper we just published, and it, it, it again is changing the face of how we monitor these cases. So what we're able to do is we're able to tell the cardiac surgeons whether or not something's going on in the brain. Cardiac surgeons do not think about the brain when they're performing cardiac surgery. Well, what's the value of that? The value of that is we're in an institution where if something happens in the brain during a cardiac surgeon, we can take the patient downstairs to the interventional suite and, a, and an endovascular neurosurgeon can do a strokeectomy and take the clot out and the patient, at, quite frankly, do, do fine after these procedures, as opposed to not detecting that at all and that patient ending up with a very large stroke. Um, I just uh, I'll, I'll end with a quote. This was a text I got from one of our neurosurgeons a couple of weeks ago at two o'clock in the morning after we monitored one of his cases. And, uh, and he said, it's just great to have a neurophysiology team that isn't just floating in the background. I'm definitely a better surgeon as a result of your assistance. And I think that in a nutshell really epitomizes our approach to neurosurgery and the utilization of intraoperative monitoring at UPMC. Thanks very much. Thank you, Dr. Balzer. What an incredible presentation. Thank you so much for, for sharing and being with us today. Dr. Friedlander, would you like to start us off before we enter our Q&A session? Sure, uh, what a fantastic uh, presentation. And again, speaking for myself, but not only in addition, uh, speaking for my colleagues, all the other neurosurgeons, but also for our patients. We're incredibly fortunate to have Dr. Balzer as well as the other uh, neurophys uh, faculty members, in addition to technicians. Uh, you, they're, they're, it's just an amazing team and we're incredibly fortunate uh, to have them uh, with us. I was trying to think of, a, of an analogy of what it is to have them around and I'll compare them to the nose, the sense of smell, where think if you're in a fire and you know you may be you may smell the smoke, um, the, that would be the earliest sense that there's a fire around, and, and if you don't have the nose, then you, you're going to have to de um, depend on your other senses, like seeing the fire while well, you might be too close, feeling the heat of the fire, hearing the noise of the fire. So really the nose might be, uh, would be the one that would tell you way ahead of time when there is a problem. And that's exactly what uh, Dr. Balzer and his team is doing. So Dr. Balzer, I may be calling you the nose uh, <laughs> uh, from, from, from here on. Uh, but but that that's what it is. They 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 not only provide you an early uh, insight of uh, a pending uh, problem, but also in one of the things that he that he commented when when he tells me something, I listen and I, I and, and I know that I better be thinking of what's happening and did, do I need to make a change. So again, uh, I thank you for all the work that you've done over uh, three decades uh, now, as you mentioned on behalf of uh, myself and most importantly our patients our patients uh, you know do as well because of all the members of the team and, and clearly you're a key part of the team so thank you it, it really fantastic uh, work that you and your team are doing so uh, justin if you can go ahead and then uh, see what questions we have yes thank you dr freelander we actually we have a we have a ton of questions really great questions um do you perform um do you perform remote monitoring? Could this help with the nationwide shortage of qualified people in this field? Yeah, so so the model that we use here is is somewhat of a hybrid model. So what what and this is something else we developed here at UPMC, quite frankly, is is we not only can provide the interpretation and oversight in person during these procedures, but there's a technologist in every one of these rooms across the UPMC health system. But what we are able to do is we're able to see that data in real time and communicate with the technologist and the surgical team in real time from a remote site. So for example, we provide the remote intraoperative neuromonitoring interpretation at UPMC Susquehanna and UPMC Hammond and UPMC Altoona as a, as a means by which to, to, to have, have a, a, that expertise at each one of these uh, uh, hospitals that UPMC performs these types of services in. And, and we were one of the first adopters of remote intraoperative neuromonitoring back in back in the early 90s, and it has it has grown since then. And as the as the um, question uh, asked, it, it it does in fact allow for what is an unmet need, because otherwise we'd have to have 
15 of me or 20 of me uh, across the, the, the state of Pennsylvania at each one of these sites. This allows me to, to, to be there um, from a telemedicine perspective. And, and, and as we all know uh, and have, have recognized now over the past 10 months, telemedicine has become an invaluable tool for the neurosurgical community. Excellent, thank you, Dr. Balzer. Um, is monitoring monitoring used in unplanned emergency surgeries or just surgeries that are scheduled in advance? No, we do it in all of them. We, we, we're a 24-7 service. Um, if there's a an aneurysm that comes in in the middle of the night or a spine trauma that comes in, in the middle of the night, we have a process in place where we have technologists at each one of the UPMC sites. Uh, as soon as the case is booked by the operating room, a technologist is notified. One of the oversight neurophysiologists, such as myself, is notified, and we are there when the surgery starts. So we don't, we don't. And unfortunately, a lot of these procedures. Uh, I always joke around that uh, many of these procedures never happen in the daylight, and I, I, I might be exaggerating that, but uh, unfortunately, it's true. And we are a 24/7 service, so nothing goes without monitoring um, where there is a desire for monitoring to occur. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Bowser. Um, we have so many questions here. How do you make sure that the OR team and the IONM team are speaking the same language and using the same the same terms to avoid miscommunication? That's a great question. So one of the things that I've done and, and, and we pride ourselves in is, you know, that you it can only be accomplished through education and, and through through face to face meetings with these folks. So, for example, I give lectures to the student CRNAs here at UPMC, at the School of Nursing, so that when they graduate, they understand they speak that language. I give grand rounds to the anesthesia department. I talk to the nursing staff here. And I not only do that here at Presbyterian Hospital, but I travel to all the sites where we provide monitoring and do grand rounds. I, I think that, that the success of the intraoperative monitoring is really predicated on the fact that people are putting a, a name and a face to a service and, 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 and that everyone is speaking the same language. And, and one of the things that Dr. Freelander really uh, alluded to, and I can't say enough about, is the technologists who are in each one of these rooms are inc an incredible valuable cog in this. And what we have done is we've developed an internal educational program for the technologists so that we train them here, so that when they go to Hammett or they go to Western Maryland or they go to Susquehanna, we know that the language they're speaking there is a language we taught them. So we don't have to guess about what's being said or how it's being said. So it, 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 it takes some time and it takes some wherewithal, but it, uh, it really pays dividends in the end. Thank you. Uh, excellent segue into our next question here. How does someone become qualified to be a, a technician in this field? So that's, a, that's a great question. So, so it, has, it has typically been a, um, a, an on-the-job type training um, uh, position in the field. Up until recently, one of the things I'm happy to say is we have just recently developed a collaboration with Carlo University and their neuroscience department where I teach didactic coursework at Carlo now, and they have an intraoperative neuromonitoring technologist tracked inside their neuroscience department. So when you graduate with your undergraduate in neuroscience from Carlo, you're also prepared to be a neurophysiology monitoring technologist. I have all, people will tell you who know me well, I'm a, I'm a big standardization guy, I'm a big education guy, and I think that you, you really can't skimp on that education. And, and, and the, way to, the way to ensure that, that that occurs appropriately is to create the curriculum, institute the curriculum, and, and we've created almost like a nursing program. So they have didactic coursework, but then they also do one year of clinicals with us here at Presbyterian Hospital, just like nurses do their clinical rotations their last year of school. So we've really raised the bar and really developed a program that allows us to train these people appropriately so that they can graduate and literally have, have, have uh, educational background so that they can apply for these jobs and be ready to hit the ground running. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Balzer. Uh, can you describe when IONM helped to preserve a patient's neurological function? I, I, I can I, I can describe many, many times. Um, sure. I mean, you know, I think that, for example, in in uh, craniotomy surgery, 
um, in and around eloquent cortex. You know, one of the things that we want to make sure we're not doing in patients with with uh, with brain tumors is we want to make sure that we are aggressive enough to take enough tumor out to benefit the patient. But we never want to do that at the cost of hurting the patient or developing a new neurological deficit. So on innumerable times, we are we are monitoring the motor tracks in these patients and we've told the surgeon, OK, that's far enough. We don't want to go any further. If we do go any further, there's, the patient stands a chance of having a new neurological deficit. The same is true in spine surgery. When we do scoliosis surgery, one of the things we do in scoliosis surgery is we put screws in the, in, in the bony elements of the spine, and then we put two big rods in those screws, and then we literally derotate the spine to straighten it out. Well, if we see changes in the intraoperative neuromonitoring as we do rotate the spine, we don't want to straighten the spine out at the, at, the, at the cost of the patient being plegic after the surgery. So what we can do is we can not derotate as much or make some other surgical maneuvers, do some bone work to mitigate those types of changes. So I could give you examples of where we've made a difference in every one of those procedures that I talked about. And quite frankly, much of that is in, in, in those papers we've published. So thank you. Um, what is your vision for the future of intraoperative monitoring? Well, I think I think it's it's uh, it's a couple different things. I think I think one we we continue to need to 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 publish our data in our series to to uh, to allow others to learn the the value add of the intraoperative neuromonitoring. Secondly, I think developing newer techniques in intraoperative monitoring. So one of the things that we're now doing is we're working with Carnegie Mellon University to look at signal processing techniques. So right now we look at these waveforms or squiggly lines, right? And with, with my bare eyes, I'm looking to see if there's changes in those. And that's changes in amplitude, changes in frequency. We're now applying signal processing techniques to these waveforms to even better gain a better resolution of when there's a change or when there's even a subtle change in these potentials. So we're applying newer techniques to be able to analyze these data to, to provide two things. Number one, more accurate information and two, potentially even earlier information to intervene, both of which will provide better safety for the patients. Thank you, Dr. Bowser. How is COVID affecting your services? Well, uh, I, 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 it's sort of like I was going to say, well, unfortunately, or I could say fortunately, it really hasn't at all. We, like I said, we're a 24-7 service. And um, we, if, if it's a procedure that we know that intraoperative monitoring will benefit the patient, if it's a COVID positive patient, we monitor the case. So our, our service goes as a neurosurgical service goes here. And as Dr. Friedlander alluded to in, in, in his introduction and discussion of COVID, um, you know, we, we, we want to keep taking care of patients. Um, we don't want patients not to come to the hospital because of COVID. We want to make sure that they feel comfortable coming here. And for example, that it's not as if the IONM isn't available because of COVID. We, we are fully available and uh, applied in any procedure that we typically would. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Bowser, we, uh, we have time for one more question, and I think it's a great one to end on here. Uh, what are the what are you most proud of when it comes to the service that you you and your colleagues provide to patients at UPMC and the University of Pittsburgh? I, I think I would have to say that uh, I'm most proud of the, the relationship that we have with the neurosurgeons at UPMC and the anesthesiologist. I think that something that Dr. Freelander touched on is 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 really of the utmost importance for the success of an intraoperative neuromonitoring program, and that's trust. And I think that over the last 30 years, I have made um, the building of that trust paramount between myself and my team and my technologists and the anesthesiologists and particularly the neurosurgeons. The neurosurgeons at our institution know that when we speak and whatever's coming out of our mouths is always being relayed to them with the best interest of the patient in mind and that what we are telling them is potentially impactful for that patient. And the reason the trust is so important, and if you remember my algorithm slide, that bottom, that bottom box consideration, that's really, really important. And, and what I, I think I'm proudest of is um, 
you know, when I when I walk into the operating room or one of my technologists speaks to the surgeons or I speak to the surgeons or we talk about cases at a patient care conference that the, 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 there's mutual respect between the neurosurgical discipline and the neurophysiology discipline. And it, it's only through that mutual respect that the um, that the superb patient care can occur utilizing the intraoperative neuromonitor. Thank you, Dr. Balzer, and thank you for such an incredible presentation, and thank you for making surgery safer for patients at UPMC. Uh, Dr. Friedlander, would you like to close us out for the day? Um, thank you, uh, Justin and uh, uh, Dr. Balzer, not only respect, but also admiration for the really phenomenal uh, work that you and, and your team uh, do for, uh, for all of us and for our patients. So this will be the uh, the last uh, uh, interview uh, that we have for this year. Uh, we've had a very remarkable uh, year. We started uh, this uh, event a number of uh, months ago at the beginning of uh, COVID really to relay some of the work that we've been doing as well as to talk about uh, COVID and the, and the whole situation and again to urge our uh, patients uh, to make sure that they come uh, here. So as uh, we end uh, the year, uh, I want to wish uh, everybody a happy and healthy holiday season uh, and new year. Please uh, stay safe. Uh, remember that uh, the lights at the end of the tunnel in terms of uh, the end of the, this uh, pandemic uh, vaccination has uh, started and uh, uh, we can't wait for, for everybody that wants uh, the vaccine uh, uh, to get it. So again, uh, I also want to thank uh, Justin and his whole uh, team uh, and Paul Stanek uh, who's uh, been uh, part of our, our team and putting these uh, these uh, talks uh, together really uh, has been uh, phenomenal. We've gotten uh, great feedback by from so many uh, people and uh, we'll obviously continue to do this uh, uh, at this point. So again, Happy New Year uh, to everybody. We'll be back on January 8th. Uh, we'll be interviewing Dr. Brad Gross, uh, one of our neurosurgeons who's a very skilled uh, endovascular uh, practitioner. So again, thank you very much. Uh, stay safe and we'll see you in a few weeks. Thank you.